Hello everyone and welcome. My name's Steve Walker. I'm an actor, voiceover artist, radio presenter and YouTuber with a huge passion for wild camping in Scotland. You're listening to a podcast for Camping on the Wild Side. Thank you very much for joining me on this podcast. This is Camping on the Wild Side. And basically what I do here is I have a YouTube channel and I go away doing wild camping trips. And this podcast is basically a breakdown of how, why, where, all the ins and outs of my trip. So thanks very much for joining me. So, Scotland. It's an absolutely beautiful place. It's vast, it's remote, it's got loads of hills, loads of mountains, and the history is just breathtaking. So this is my home country, and I love wild camping and exploring the remote areas we have here. This trip is all about a solo night's wild camp in the Lost Valley in Glencoe, in Scotland. So normally I start off by planning, and before any trip, I try to discover where I could go, where I can go and explore, where I haven't been. So that's what I do. I look at the map. I assess the location. So it could be anywhere from the Highlands to the Lowlands to Galloway Forest Park to Perthshire. Anywhere is a bonus. Then I assess the journey time to what I'm doing. So if, I don't, if I'm going away for a night, I don't want to spend six hours, seven hours getting there really want to be in within reason unless I extend that to a couple of days trip and then I want to what do I want to achieve so if it's something like I want to see stars I just want to stare at stars all night I want to go somewhere where there's very a dark space so somewhere like the Galloway Forest Park or somewhere very remote up north where there's less light pollution so that's kind of what I deal with and then there's a big aspect with every trip is safety Safety is a priority for for everything. So you want to assess how the terrain is, the weather, all that kind of stuff as well, and what your limits are, what you're capable of. Once I have an area in mind, like the Highlands or Galloway Forest Park, I narrow it down. So with this trip, it was kind of different because it was somewhere where I wanted to go to. But normally... If it was in the Highlands, I would pick the Highlands as a as a main base to narrow in, and then I would sort of pinpoint where I would like to go within that district or that area um, of my camp. For this one, this for this solo camp up in the the Lost Valley, I did have a backup plan just in case things didn't go to plan as they do, um, and have done. And then once I've done all that. And I have my point. I do check the weather report. So back in December we had these very, very cold nights. 
and the freezing temperatures which caused serious problems across Scotland. Aberdeen was hitting, I think, roughly minus 15 degrees, and I think Glencoe was between minus 1 and minus 10. That was kind of what I was dealing with. And then I also had to drive up there. So you're constantly checking updates and traffic and travel, um, any road closures and diversions as well, and all these road conditions, just because of the time of year it is, um, etc. You know. So at this point, I've done the planning. I know where I'm going. I've done some preparation, done the weather report, and I've checked the updates for my driving. Then comes the all-important kit list. So putting together a kit list is probably quite a serious point because you've got to take in consideration, yes, again, your weather, um, where you're going, how long you're going for. So all these sort of aspects come into play. So I'm going to run through my kit list as it is and when I took it up. I'll try and explain some of this stuff for those who don't know much about it. But anyway, my main tent that I took up. So the tent I took was the MSR Elixir 1. It's a great little tent. It's only a couple of kilograms in weight. Uh, a good little one-man backpacking tent. My sleeping bag was a Mountain Warehouse Extreme Four Season sleeping bag. So this was quite a big, it is quite a bulky sleeping bag. And it is a really good one. It's pretty warm. The roll mat was a Berghaus self-inflate airbed kind of mattress. It's really good again. Takes you off the ground by an inch, I think. Um, also had a Gore-Tex line sheet, which I lie down underneath everything so it keeps that protective barrier. I carried um, a pocket knife, a folding shovel, a hot water bottle. I could have left this bit to the last to say, but the hot water bottle is one of the best things I've ever taken. It's not the full size one, it's just like a little one, probably half the size, but it is absolutely brilliant and I've found out that it's a, probably a key part or a key item that I would probably take all the time. I've also taken hand warming pads, so these little pocket sashes, and you get them in a pack. Um, you they but they got granules in them. You give it a a shake. You give it a scrunch up and a shake again, and you mix all the granules together, and it keeps you. It produces heat. So these heat pads are the ones I took in particular last eight hours, and they were absolutely brilliant. So got hand warmer pads, socks couple of spares as well, a little pillow, nothing too fancy just to take the head off the ground. Sleeping bag liner, I didn't actually use it but I do take it. Um, This is just basically a, a, basically a sleeping bag but not very thick, it's just a liner that goes inside your sleeping bag. You go in it, any dirt or whatever goes inside the liner. It's just basically to keep your sleeping bag from clean. I also took the DD Magic Carpet. DD is the make and it's basically a little sheet and you can convert that into a shelter with a couple of poles and pegs and guy lines or you can use it as a waterproof sheet to go over everything. I, I kind of, I didn't need it. It's always like a little backup thing that I have. I always seem to take it. It's It folds away into nothing. So it's quite, uh, it's a piece of equipment that I always take. Lights spare batteries as well we've got paracord which is basically tough string in a in a kind of way i took a survival bag and that's a big priority for me now i think on occasions with kind of other a lot of people just dismiss it i'll be fine a survival bag is probably about six feet long three feet wide you could probably get a couple of people in it it, it would say you can get different bags for the amount of people that you're going. If you're going away in a group of four, you could probably get a survival bag that would take four people. Um, we never think it's going to happen to us, but the thing that I now carry with me in my head is I might meet somebody who hasn't got one 
and is needing one and can't be moved. So I'm kind of like just opening my horizons up a little bit just in case I bump into somebody else. Or you never know, I might just need it myself. So anyway, that's a survival bag. It folds up in just a six inch square. I also took my Van Gogh stove. Great little stove. Um, So simple. Foolproof. It's great. It's done me so many times. It's a, it's a great little thing. I also took uh, cooking pots. These are just small items that, that are easily carried in the back of your rucksack. Camping gas bottle, just one, um, which is, a, again, it just sits inside my pot. It would probably do me four or five days, actually, but I just take one. It's just a small item. A lighting system as well, so that's like matches and lighters and things like that. Drinking cup, cleaning equipment as well for cleaning your pots and pans. So all the knife, the self-explanatory stuff. Fork, knife and spoon. A water bottle, I think the one I took was like either two or three litres. It's a dumpy thing, so it's fits fairly s- straightforward into your back. Box fire, or a bush box. This is a great little thing. And it folds up into a flat pack, so it's like a wee construction thing you build. And you can actually have a physical fire in it. So you can get little bits of brash and wood and kindling and things and make a physical fire. And boy, did I need this. And also took some hexi blocks for that reason for the fire. So then going on to um, camera equipment. So the camera equipment I took was a tripod. I took two tripods, a large one and a small one. The phone that I use is a Samsung A5 phone. I have upgraded since, but at that point, that's what it was. I also have a Sony Cybershot HD camera with spare batteries and a small power bank. This camera has done me great. I would like to upgrade because there is things I want to try out in later camps and future camps. But that camera is the one I took and it done me great. Also have clothing. So I had spare socks, extra walking trousers, I had a pair of gaiters, padded outer walking trousers, gloves, a couple of pairs, woolly hat. Sleeping for my at night time, um, I had some long johns, padded sleep shoes, thermal top, and my main jacket was the crag hoppers. It was a from Craghoppers, that's a, a big walking waterproof jacket, and a set of walking poles from DD, which were great. Then I move on to food. So I took, obviously, my water was with me as well, I took that up. Main meals were Summit to Eat, which is a freeze-dried packet food. Summit to Eat is the make of this company that makes food. It's high calorie, and they do a lot of different flavours and recipes and that kind of thing. So basically you just add water to it. Also took a selection of nuts, chocolates, um, some nibbles, energy bars, sweets and some porridges as well. All for one night. All this kit actually gets packed up into my rucksack. It might sound a lot of kit but actually it's not really. Um, So yes, all that kit gets put into the rucksack. It's a 65 litre rucksack from Berghaus. It's got all the pockets and it does exactly what I need. It's comfortable to wear and I've had it for ages and it does the job. So this gives you an insight into just what I actually have to take away for a night. So if you'd like to see the video about this kit list, you can go to my YouTube channel, which is Camping on the Wild Side. I have a video specifically about the kit list so you can physically see what I'm actually talking about. And if you'd like to watch the video regarding this whole podcast, you can do the same thing. It is all on YouTube at Camping on the Wild Side. So now I'm all ready. I've done all my prep. Everything's packed. I've got all my kit in. The rucksack's in the car. It's now time to set off. I normally go away during the week. 
A, because it's quieter, or B, because I can please myself. And at the end of the day, it was the week before Christmas, so I thought it would be quiet going up the road there. I did set off late from Ayrshire, and that niggled me all the way. But I did try and relax into it, so it didn't make me make any rash decisions like put my foot down or all that kind of stuff. So, leaving the M77 to get onto the M8 and heading for the Erskine Bridge, this was the route I actually took to get to Glencoe. It was actually a pleasant drive, and I've done it loads of times before. It's a great road, and just pointing out that West Coast drivers or probably more so Glasgow drivers, are one of the most courteous people in Scotland. Look, we're all actually going places and doing things. That's the way it is. And if we all work together, we keep it moving. And if you indicate in the West Coast, people let you in, you give them a little flash of the indicators, and you move on. It's just the courteous kind of thing to do. And it makes everything great. It doesn't cause any aggro. It's a nice little thank you and we get on our way. Just thought I'd throw that in there because the West Coast drivers are good. So don't just barge in. It just causes a little bit of aggression and we don't need that. Anyway, crossing the Erskine Bridge and bypassing Dumbarton. It wasn't long until I caught a glimpse of this beautiful Loch Lomond. It's a lovely part of the country. Passing the village of Luss a little bit further up makes a short welcome stop if you need fuel or a little coffee stop, but it can be pretty busy in the summertime and good weather. As you head further up, after leaving Luss, the hills and mountains come into sight. Ben Lomond, away on your right-hand side, stands 974 metres as a popular choice for climbers. It's an amazing climb. You get some great views of the whole of Loch Lomond. So still driving north as we're heading for Crean Larach. This road can be a pretty slow road due to the narrowness. It's not built for a lot of traffic and it's the only road north that you can get on and has all the buses and lorries. It's a very busy road so it's taking care is probably your priority. So paying attention and driving carefully is always an advantage. They can't even widen it either. Um, Loch Lomond water sides on your right hand side and on your left hand side you've got trees and walls and dikes and parts of housing as well so you can't win. Anyway, you need to t- take your time when you're driving up that road. So the road soon opens out and bypassing Crean Larach. If you need to have a stop, the Green Welly Boot or the Welly Boot, whatever you want to call it, is a good stop to to have a rest, coffee, all that stuff, fuel up. Um, It's a great wee place, I normally stop there all the time. So the journey from Tindrum to Glencoe is one of the most beautiful and the most scenic views with its vast spans of hills and the land is just amazing. It takes you through the Rannoch Moor which is so desolate and it's a very barren land but it holds so much beauty and ruggedness and if you park up you can get some of the great views it's just absolutely an amazing place to be it's just miles and miles of nothing so endless views at the other end of um, the Rannoch Moor it blends into the start of Glencoe and this by far is one of the most beautiful places on earth I think anyway and it's more historical and the ruggedness that's I think people find attractive. Many drivers and walkers will tell you the same. It's just amazing. You get amazing views from the road and even better ones when you're up the top of the mountains. I have camped on a couple of different parts of Glencoe and each time it just gives you a fantastic and different view. And it actually holds you fast in in a trance just looking out. It's just amazing. So... I drove slowly through Glencoe. Um, it's just a brilliant place to look um, at taking in the scenery. I've driven through there thousands of times and each time it's different. A new expanded car park is not far in 
and it allows buses and many cars to pack up and stretch your legs. This car park was where I would park my car for the night for my camping trip. Once out the car, and after taking in the views of Glencoe, I picked up my kit and headed down to the little pathway, which this eased into the start of my adventure, to the start of the Lost Valley. The path to the start was pretty decent, but all that changed as I got further in. It became a sheet of ice. In sections, it was pretty hairy. I can't lie, my heart was racing as I entered this new adventure and little did I know what I was going to encounter. Following a scramble up a rock face, which had a cable line as a handrail, that tells you all. I hit a decent path through a mixed woodland of silver birch trees and long grasses, which at this time of the year was magical. And along with the birds tweeting around me, it was just a lovely place to be. I had watched some footage of YouTube a while back on um, the Lost Valley and just the path in. And it gives you a little bit of an insight into what it's like. But by the time I got there, I couldn't even remember what the video was called. So everything was new again. Everything that I'd watched had gone out the window. So by this point, it was actually kicking on two o'clock, half past two in the afternoon. And I wanted to make good progress up there, but at the same time, take in these amazing views and experience the climb, because that's what we do it for. And unfortunately, it was going to be dark at about half past four. So time was at me. The views that were coming into sight were great, and I just couldn't believe the ones that were behind me. It was just utterly amazing. The path was great, and... I had further pockets of ice lying with water that was frozen on, on, on the path and it did make it difficult. I was so glad that I actually brought the walking poles to help, which are a godsend. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't leave them behind now, always have them. So I continued up the path, a little dusting of snow in areas made it a scramble to navigate uh, the winding pathway. And in some areas, I actually lost the path completely, as it became just a pile of rocks to negotiate. I gained height and progress, but it was actually slow, and subconsciously knowing I needed to get going because of the time, but also I wanted to enjoy this journey. It wasn't a clear view all the way up, and the most I could see was probably about 50 yards with trees and rock formation restricting my way. I came to a clearing and I was actually blown away. I came face to face with a waterfall. Probably, I'm going to say about probably 70 feet high. And it was completely frozen. It's one of these things that you don't see on a regular basis. And I had never seen this before. And being that close up, it was actually pretty special. You could actually see the water moving underneath it. It was frozen and little pockets of water were bubbling underneath it and it looked, a big section of it actually looked like a giant bit of bubble wrap. You could just see the water sliding underneath it which made it look like it was popping. It was actually quite amazing. So I spent a wee bit of time there and then I continued to press on as I left the ice behind after after several water crossings and precarious rock scrambles, it opened up to a large mound. So at this point, I took my rucksack off, I slid my hat down, I pulled my gloves off, wiped the sweat from my face, and I was utterly speechless. The Lost Valley was before my eyes. And this was actually spectacular. A very different picture in real life. And when you see it in a photo, it's just not the same. Seeing it in my own eyes was breathtaking. And the sheer size and scale of the Lost Valley was utterly incredible. I stood there for about 10 minutes, taking in the views 
and it actually immediately takes you back to the famous massacre of Glencoe. For some strange reason, it did. So the massacre of Glencoe was back in 1692, when 30 members of the Clan MacDonald were killed by government soldiers of the Clan Campbell for allegedly for failing to pledge allegiance to the new monarchs. It, it didn't actually happen in the Lost Valley, but I'm quite sure members had fled into the mountains and valleys to escape throughout Glencoe, and you get that feeling they actually did go up the Lost Valley. I was just in that trance for a, a certain time, and it did feel very uneasy. The grey skies were drawn in at this point, and so at this point I actually had to head down the short distance, down the sloping path, to the frozen flat area below. It was easily the size of two football pitches. It was incredible. I didn't have much time to waste, so I set up my camera for a time lapse of the sun setting, or what was left of it which turned out to be pretty good, actually. During this time, I unpacked the tent and proceeded to set it up. All didn't go well, as I couldn't actually get the pegs in at the ground. I had to use a rock to hit them in, making them only go in about an inch, and put the rock on top of the guy rope to keep the peg in place. It was just simply frozen. It didn't take me long to get everything else sorted. The ground sheet I put down, then the self-inflate air mat, and then the sleeping bag, and then put my sleeping bag inside the bivvy bag. By now I was using my head torch, and the cold began to nip. With everything in place, it was time to get a coffee on, to give me a heat. I also cracked open the little heat pads, and placed them in my pockets for later. Getting your kit in place, and in order makes things so much easier and saves you such a lot of hassle during the night so all the food can be put to one side for easiness. With the water boiling on the stove it was a welcome sound and inside the tent I poured my coffee. As I had said earlier at the start of the week temperatures in Aberdeen were as low as minus 15 so here in Glencoe I would have said they would have been about between minus 1 and minus 10. So I was definitely in for a cold night. But I did have all my warm gear and plenty of food to keep me going. As hunger started to make me feel aware it was dinner time, I'd sorted the meal for tonight, which was chicken tikka with rice by Summit to Eat. Summit to Eat is a make of food that's freeze-dried and you just add boiling water. It's full of good calories, high calorie food, and they're pretty decent. You add the hot water, and it takes about eight minutes. So, when that's cooking away there in the bag, you can go and sort stuff out that need be. There's nothing better than getting hot food inside you on a cold freezing night. My breath seemed to steam up the camera as I was trying to film. That's the cold reacting with the heat. Being fed and topped up with high calorie snacks will keep everything working. I had enough coffees to do me a couple of days and plenty of food. Now I was all fed and watered and I had snacks in my pocket. It was actually time to venture outside into the valley for a wander in the dark. Well, I had my head torch, at least. My dinner had given me a good feast inside to keep me warm. And as I walked, I felt like the temperature had got a little bit milder. But I think it was just me generating my own heat. It was so still. Not a breath of wind. And it was so quiet. Which made things very spooky. Looking up at the night sky, well, it was more like six or seven o'clock, but all the same, the stars were out. And boy, what a show. Your eyes didn't know where to look and just in case you missed something, so your eyes were darting all over the night sky. After several failed attempts of trying to capture the stars on my camera, 
I gave up. I felt it was time to retire to the comfort and warmth of my sleeping bag. With a coffee. I was warm and snuggled down and put the stove on for the last time to get the hot water for my little hot water bottle I brought. I absolutely love this little great thing and it's well worth it, especially for the night I had. Being alone when you're wild camping makes you very aware that you have to do everything yourself and your senses are very heightened to do things around you, meaning you can only make yourself warm and you can only make your dinner. You can't just sit back and be cold and not be bothered eating. So here I was in my sleeping bag, all cosy, my heat pads in my pockets, and my hot water bottle inside my jumper. It was bliss. The only problem at this point I had was being conscious that my tent pegs were only in the ground an inch, and if they came out, I would have to go out and fix them. And also, the temperatures had now dropped considerably further. It was freezing. I did nod off a few times, and it did take me a while because I could not relax, because of the pegs, and how cold it was becoming. Not that I was cold. It was just very hard to relax. At some point in the middle of the night, I was awakened by the sound of what sounded like tent flapping. And I immediately thought a peg had come out. I lay there for a while until I had to do something. So at first I opened a little bit of the zip to peer out and get a sense of what it was like outside. In front of me, I couldn't believe it, was a little mouse. It was actually feasting on the remnants of my dinner in the packaging. It scurried away and I zipped my sleeping bag back up. It disappeared. Job done. Or so I thought. Not long after I hit the pillow, the noise started again. So I peered out the open zip again and watched the little mouse feeding on the remnants of the food again. I just sat there, watching him eat away. It was actually quite a nice experience. He eventually scurried away and I lifted the package in so I could get some peace. I tried to get some more sleep, which was broken, with me tossing and turning, because I'm such a fidget. Morning arrived, and the inside of the outer tent was all frosted up. It was a cold start for sure. You know, stepping out of a tent is always the hardest part to do. Leaving the warmth and comfort of your sleeping bag is so hard. Admiring the scenery, I set up the camera for another time-lapse shoot to capture the morning sunrise. I needed a little coffee to start my morning, so I got everything ready, only to find my water was frozen. Frozen solid in the bottle. A classic schoolboy error. But to be fair, I'm not sure even if it would have helped if the bottle of water was inside the tent as well. It was just so cold. So hatching a plan, I dug out my emergency backup plan, which was, I went for a wander, got some kindling and some little branches that were lying about in the ground, and came back and built my little bush box fire, and got it lit. It's a rewarding and comforting sight and feeling when you have a little fire. It boosts morale, and... I needed the heat in the cold weather. My plan was to keep it burning to melt the frozen water in my plastic bottle. So I placed it by the heat to start melting, but this would take a while. I came up with another plan, so I went for a wander. I had picked some icicles from a water source that was frozen. I placed them in my pot and got them on a fire. I've never had to do this before but it actually worked a treat. It was very rewarding to make a cup of coffee from icicles. Breakfast time consisted of porridge and coffee. My heat pads had done the trick all night and were still hot to touch, so they were well worth the small purchase. It was soon time for me to pack up my belongings, but only after I admired the view again in the Lost Valley of Glencoe. I felt very small, surrounded by the vast rock face. 
and mountain tops which towered either side of me. It was absolutely amazing. As I was cooking and packing my camp away, a little robin joined me, searching for food. I gladly helped him by scattering some food. It was a nice sight for the morning. With my tent and my rucksack all packed up, it was my time to leave this amazing place. I had the whole place and night to myself, which was a nice feeling deep down. I did come up with a saying when I was there. It goes, There are 8 billion people in the world, with 66 million of them in the UK, and I was the only one here. I think I actually gobsmacked myself by saying that out loud. It took me a moment to realise just how that came about. Leaving my camping spot with no trace, apart from a small pile of food I left for the little robin, is what every wild camper does, and should do. It's a pet hate of mine, seeing people leaving rubbish behind them. There's just no need, and there's no excuse for it. I would love to say that this part of the journey is the easiest, but as statistics go, if I can say that right, it's probably one of the most dangerous, because this is where walkers and hikers let their guard down. When they're walking back down, this is where it's going to be a challenge again. This is probably where most broken bones, twisted ankles and injuries are caused. It definitely was a challenge heading back down. Ice still played a big factor as I walked down. Frozen puddles and slippery rocks were plentiful. Taking my time, and in no rush, I descended with the most wonderful views in front of me. I left the freezing Lost Valley, which on the trek down, turned warmer and became a little better to walk on. There are probably more injuries caused descending a mountain than going up, due to the nature of people in a rush to get down. It was a nice sight when I crossed a small wooden bridge at the bottom and headed up the path where I left the car. This leads me to finalise my solo wild camping in the Lost Valley of Glencoe. What an absolute epic little adventure and everyone I do I enjoy for different reasons but most are in the same way. I thrive on adventures and at exploring Scotland and the remote areas. So if you like this podcast and you'd like to see the video, you can check out the YouTube video for this podcast and you can see the beauty of the Lost Valley for yourself. I also done a video of the kit list, as I said earlier, and you can check that out. So please do. If you'd like to watch the videos, you can go to my YouTube channel, which is Camping on the Wild Side. That's my YouTube uh, channel. You can also subscribe and like the videos and comment if you please. Um, it would be great to have you on board and love to connect with you to see how your journey goes. And you can also follow me on Facebook, which is Camping on the Wild Side. And you can also follow me on Instagram, which is Camping on the Wild Side Scotland. So thank you again for listening. Please take care, and you've been listening to the podcast from Camping on the Wild Side.